Hello and welcome back to another episode of Examining the Witness. In this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, about the monastery area. Um, but before we get there, we're going to just take some time to enjoy this nice little peninsula across the bay from the town. Um, because there's some important symbolism going on in this peninsula. There's a very famous statue here, and uh, and I think it's... Uh, it's good to talk about, especially in connection with the monastery, which contains a lot of interesting information about the symbols uh, and the symbolism of the witness. So we have this this beautiful um, statue here, which you've all seen before. Um, a man reaching for a cup, and uh, so it's uh, of course it's it's not clear who any of the statues are or, or if they stand for individual people. But there's an audio log nearby that uh, that is uh, by uh, Nicholas of Cusa, one of my favorite audio log subjects, and and this guy has kind of an old timey dress, um, and uh, and uh, haircut and old shoes and things like that. Um, but so so to my mind, he's I've always imagined that this is Cusa, um, but it doesn't matter. He could be anybody. He could be anybody that shares the witness's kind of goals and spirit. So you can see here in classic witness style, there's a lot of stuff going on. He's reaching up. Towards this, uh, towards this cup, um, it's out of his grasp. It's like the Holy Grail, um, and uh, and many people have noted as is the classic witness illusion. There's two things going on. So here, the cup is out of reach. Um, it's uh, it's it's distant. It's as Kusa would say, it's behind the wall of paradise. You know, this symbolizes this this impossible, invisible God that he can't get to. Um, but then in the in the shadow. Um, we have this perfect portrait of of a man reaching up and indeed successfully uh, reaching this. Now, now it doesn't look much like a cup anymore. It looks kind of like a eight pointed star or a, maybe a seven pointed star. In fact, the portrait is so complete you can tell that this is intentional, partially because of the, like the completely perfect uh, right angle framing, as opposed to this over here, um, but also because they've. The, the people who set up the island actually removed a, a bar on this side uh, in order that the shadow uh, would be perfect versus these others have all four sides intact. So that's a clever bit of uh, clever touch that you've probably seen mentioned before on the internet or something if you're a, if you're a regular on the witness reddit. But, uh, but what you may not have seen before is the way that this extends to cover even more of what's going on. So so what is Kusa doing here? He's reaching for the cup, but this is also, it's not just the paradox of it's out of his grasp and yet it's within his grasp. And of course this is playing with the, the witness's usual, like many ideas about projection and two-dimensionality versus three-dimensionality, flatness versus depth, hierarchy versus immediate perception, that kind of thing. But because his hand is able to grasp that cup, it means that his hand and his gaze is also looking right up at the sun. You see how the sun is right above the cup, but I'm I'm even right above his hand. So if I lowered myself down a little bit, the sun would really be right in the cup, casting the shadow. So the sun line passes directly through the cup to his hand. So he's reaching for the sun. So what the witness is saying here is that this cup symbolizes the same thing that the sun symbolizes. That 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 unification of uh, third-person scientific knowledge with first-person conscious experience to give that kind of, some kind of transcendent understanding of the universe. Um, and, uh, and of course, we're familiar with the sun symbolism from, from like, the sun gate and other places in the witness where they talk about the sun and the eclipse symbolism that we run into in Secret of, uh, Secret of Psalm 46. Sun's a very important symbol in the witness. Also, a fusion reaction, as I talked about in uh, the very first episode of the series when I mentioned its connection to Braid. But there's even more. But wait, there's more. So, here he is, uh, uh, reaching for this cup that symbolizes the sun. But if we, you know, why this this thing, wh why, wh we could have entered from this side and still seen him, like, looking at the sun, but instead the game makes us walk around in this wacky spiral. Um, is it just because the game hates us, or wants to be like a walking simulator? Well, I personally like walking simulators, and I like this peninsula, but that's not why. It's because as you enter, I'm going to try and enter this as squarely as possible. As you enter this ruin, um, you, this framing and this, this hole that's fallen out of the wall, right? They didn't have to cut out a giant uh, hole out of this ruin, but it reveals the mountain as well. So here we have 
Nicholas of Cusa, or whoever it is, maybe we should trace it from his eye, through the cup, uh, through his hand, uh, through the cup, through, and eh, the mountain doesn't quite line up, but, you know, it was probably lower when they were developing the game, and they decided to make it taller or something, and then to the sun off screen. So, so the game is saying the cup symbolizes, uh, the mountain top, uh, the cup and the mountain top and the sun are all, uh, the same symbolic object. They all, uh, represent that kind of pinnacle of, of, uh, of achievement or understanding. Um, so that's a very important, uh, uh, a little bit of a code unlocking some of the symbolism of the witness. Remember, we also saw so much sun symbolism in the, in the sun temple. And if you remember the little star shape of that, uh, sun temple, we also, down here, we see the logo of the modern-day organization that is, like, placing all of these mysterious panels and things. Bears a very strong resemblance to the, uh, to the sun symbols, even of the ancient temple of the very first people. So, there's a strong through-line here, symbolically. Um, and finally, what is this, this strange, uh, hexagon shape? I believe it's hexagon shape. Let's count. One, two... Oh, wait a second. Okay, one, two, three, four, five... Six, yeah, hexagon, um, which is interesting because that's a hexagon. This is actually a seven-pointed cup, um, and then uh, later on the island there, there's eight-pointed stars. So, uh, so I, I, I think you know maybe, uh, I think this, you know, if you, if you look at this, it looks a lot like the eight-pointed star symbol that we see later on. And there's there's other reasons that we'll discuss in the monastery to think that this cup symbolism and the eight-pointed stars and the bridges in the treehouse area are all connected in one sort of network of, of related symbols. Um, but uh, we'll get to that stuff later. But anyways, this giant structure, um, of course, used to be a lighthouse. It's built out here on the peninsula. It's meant to guide uh, ships as they come in, um, as they come into the harbor here, to the town. So this is, I mean, literally a guiding light, right? This is kind of a declaration of of the the core principles of this town that they that they're out here in this lighthouse that's like welcoming people like the Statue of Liberty to the Witness Island um, that they have all of this sun symbolism going on here in the game. Um, but to just top that off, and then we'll go right over to the monastery area. We have a, an audio log by our favorite Nicholas of Cusa. Oh Lord God, helper of those who seek you, I see you in the garden of paradise and I do not know what I see because I see nothing visible I know this alone that I know that I do not know what I see and that I can never know I do not know how to name you because I do not know what you are should anyone tell me that you are named by this or that name by the fact that one gives a name I know that it is not your name for the wall beyond which I see you is the limit of every mode of signification by names. Should anyone express any concept by which you could be conceived, I know that this concept is not a concept of you. For every concept finds its boundary at the wall of paradise. Should anyone express any likeness and say that you ought to be conceived according to it, I know in the same way that this is not a likeness of you. So too, if anyone, wishing to furnish the means by which you might be understood, should set forth an understanding of you, one is still far removed from you. For the highest wall separates you from all these, and secludes you from everything that can be said or thought, because you are absolute from all the things that can fall within any concept. Nicholas of Cusa. 1453. So, Cusa wrote that in 1453, which is just striking that, you know, in the, in the year that the, uh, uh, that Constantinople, uh, was taken over by the Ottoman Empire, which is like something from ancient history, um, and yet he can write something that still, if you can get past the kind of paradoxical, invisible, visible, uh, uh, language, uh, paradoxical and yet beautiful and poetic, um, still rings true today. Um, so that's just Cusa expressing the that impossible gulf between words and concepts and any any tangible physical idea um, versus the the immediacy and the sort of totally different nature of of our direct experience of the world um, and of Cusa's idea of 
of God or of reality, that there's no name you can put on it, because God isn't a name, um, or the universe isn't a name. So, the, um, the monastery is, is certainly devoted to that idea. Um, unlike other areas in the Witness, which are all about, um, like the Sun Temple had a lot to say about metaphor and representation and reflection, um, the monastery is one of the places in the Witness that's more devoted to that, uh, the, that kind of direct uh, Zen, uh, direct conscious awareness side of the spectrum. Um, and we see that declared right on the door, right? We've got this, we've got this wonderful environmental puzzle right here. And, uh, and it's not just one, it's like a billion. Um, all of these gray stones form an environmental puzzle. And uh, let's see, can we can probably get something worked out here? Uh, uh, might be a little difficult. Yeah, that looks about right. Oh no, what am I doing? Um, so there's just one representative one, there's, I mean, there's, there's probably four or five, um, and, um, and that kind of lays out, uh, that, that this area is, is devoted more to the end of the spectrum that's represented by the environmental puzzles and less to what's represented by the panel puzzles. Notice also the strong um, red and green symbolism in this area. The monastery, of course, is bright red with that beautiful tree, um, and then it's surrounded by this lush green, and then the environmental puzzle itself was green. But let's head indoors. So we see it's, uh, it's abandoned. It's kind of ramshackle. The rafters have fallen apart. Fortunately, we're still able to make our way in. Got one more. Mm, I I never even realized this, but actually, if you're familiar with uh, the later puzzles here, even though this seems trivial, like hey, I already clicked this, why why are you making me unlock it again? Um, but this is actually introducing in a super uh, super easy, hard to even notice that there's any kind of puzzle associated with this. But it's introducing the concept uh, that'll later be uh, be key to this area, which is kind of sniping a solution in between uh, obstacles like this this fence. Like right here, there's no obstacle at all. You'd have to stand at an extreme angle in order to uh, block it. But uh, but this one is a little bit, you know, you do have to be in the right spot. You could be right there, that doesn't work. Um, so it's this very gentle introduction, so gentle that it seems totally redundant, but it is actually doing doing something here. So we've got our two doors open. Um, we can come in here and see this beautiful uh, light coming in through here with the kind of pre-calculated um, lighting that the witness has that allows these wonderful like you know uh, bounce uh, lightings that, that that give everything so much color um, this is like a old um, banyan or not banyan uh, I've yeah banyan tree so the one the ones that uh, that drop roots and then the roots create more um, more trunks. So this is an interesting, and then and then we have this, which is a kind of microcosm of uh, a, a miniature representation of the entire uh, area, and also a, a flattened two-dimensional structure. Here you've got the flatness of the panel versus the three-dimensional structure, because of course there's like columns here and there and all over the place. This kind of 3D matrix that we're inside with these rafters, but it's being overgrown with this organic form. So I think this is a bit of an artistic statement about the contrast between the, the organic, the living, the direct, versus the abstract, um, and the, the mechanical and the mathematical, uh, which of course mirrors the, the relationship between the environmental puzzles and the panel puzzles. Uh, 
All right, so of course with all these connections, there's always some some game going on. Um, so here, this again is the witness's idea of not being able to complete a line because it's being blocked by something. So we can go around like this. Or actually, I don't want to waste time. We're going to go like that. But as you can see, there's uh, metal panels that are closing and opening. And the unclosed side uh, of each uh, of this miniature diagram will become the the unclosed side of the actual monastery. Um, so here we see a, a progression of puzzles, um, in which the the object here is you gotta you gotta fit the puzzle into here. Now it's possible to spend a very long time, and I personally did spend a very long time, um, just like I kind of got stuck on the reflection one uh, in the in the sun temple. You know, you can you can stand out here and just like spend forever trying to figure out what the correct solution is. Like, does it have to do with this leaf? But there's really no clue. But once you're inside the building, uh, it becomes very clear. So it's also kind of a, I mean, once you do get it, then it becomes a little bit of a boring puzzle. There's a slight elaboration um, that is possible of this sequence. Here we have this very simple, kind of obvious, or not that obvious, but uh, somewhat possible to notice zigzag. Um, over here we've got this more complex uh, mural, uh, which just appears to be a tree, right? We've got a little tree, a big tree, um, and if we fit it right, then we can go through. So this bears some resem resemblance to the shadow puzzles that we'll talk about later, but it's distinct, of course. Oh, what happened? Oh, of course. Okay, so this is, this is calling back, so funny, it's a mural of a tree, um, and it's calling back to our, our experience with the broken wood in the, uh, in the apple orchard earlier when we remember when we had that that cut off uh, apple on the final puzzle of the of the apple orchard um, there was that missing apple and so we had to we had to make our judgments based on where there was a missing branch all right so now we gotta we gotta watch out for for this missing branches that we know were there there we go so that's a slight extension um, and Oh, th there's a good twist. So now we can see where the puzzle comes from, but of course we can't follow it because the whole building has collapsed, um, which I think is po and it's possibly also related to that audio log about house builder, you are seen, you shall not build the house again, some Buddhist mythology there about the broken down house. All right, so now we got to do a little bit, this is maybe a, a bit of a callback to the symmetry area to try and map, well, what would this be? Looks like we would be uh, going one down and then two over and then one down again, something like that. Oh. There we go. Now I've got two things. We've got a door that opens onto this beautiful Zen garden, which I actually don't like that much. So we'll get out of here. It's okay. It's got some environmental puzzles, but you know, it seems to be kind of disrespectful of the idea of Zen Garden to just turn it into a playground for uh, for environmental puzzles. Um, but it's fine. And there's no secret mapping. Like they don't stand for like the different vaults on that, or no seeping, secret mapping that I know about. Who knows? Maybe the the rocks like stand for something important. That'd be pretty cool, but I doubt it. All right. In other news, um, we also open up a uh, uh, the first of of this sequence here. Um, which I guess we'll just run through, get it all over with. Um, so here now, now of course, having having trained ourselves in this sort of uh, perspective uh, alignment over here, now things are going to start to get more interesting because this stuff is not all in the same plane. So this, you know, there's a lot of connections. There's so many connections between the different um, puzzle mechanics of the witness. We're we're calling back to the the pink trees mechanic, um, which which uh, both had the thing where it started flat and then progressed to a more three-dimensional thing where you're wondering like oh what branch counts this on the left and what branch counts on the right um, and uh, and then we have um, 
we uh, uh, you know the nature of these it's uh, the kind of tracing the path feels a lot like the shadow puzzles where you just have to kind of interpret the shadow correctly and then trace what's there um, and uh, and then here, this one uh, was kind of a callback to the symmetry area. We have to look back and forth and judge what it was going to be. Um, so, yeah. But now we got to deal with we got to we got to find the right you know location for all of these and find a good location from which we can trace a path. Now, from the other side. We'll probably find, see, we can't get the same path. You'd think, well, shouldn't we be able to predict the same path? So wouldn't this be a really boring puzzle? Um, but because some of these are farther um, from the uh, farther from the camera, um, we get these projection effects, and we can't work out a, um, a coherent path. So we got to use this guy over here. Um, and this, of course, is a, is a total and direct callback to the... Um, to the the shadow area because I I think this involves tracing the line no maybe it doesn't maybe it involves um uh, what's this gonna be uh, all right yeah no this still involves breaks in the lines not tracing the line. That would be a little too confusing to suddenly require people to remember the path and then trace it. There we go. Funny how beautiful that looks once you get it lined up, but it's it's quite a quite difficult to find before that. <clears throat> oh, you know, well maybe that contributes to the theme. So, okay, now we got two final puzzles, including one that people get a little bit mad with. But hey, you know, there's only like seven puzzles in this entire area, so if one of them's hard, that's okay. Um, all right, so now we got to find how these are going to line up. I'm not sure that there's any strategy to this besides maybe identifying that that thing looks like a looks like a circle. Um, ah, okay, yeah, so this is the callback to the uh, to the forest area that I was remembering. Previously we were going in between the lines. Now we're finding something that perfectly matches the line. Um, and so it's it's just like in the forest where in one area we're tracing the shadows of the sticks versus tracing the, uh, the, the paths of light in between the shadows of leaves. Um, Okay, so I'll try and remember that path. There we go. Um, now over here we can do the same thing, hopefully. There we go. There's our little knob. And of course that's a nice bit of symmetry then on the other side where you know we're tracing the, the, the absence and here we're tracing the presence, more of that. Or that crazy witness tomfoolery, um, but of course that they don't match up. So so you know players might struggle to try and find these, and they'll be like, "What's going on?" Um, but it's just it's that apple tree thing again. Look at that. What's that? Tiny little zigzag missing, fallen on the ground, broken off, just like the apple tree. Uh, an infuriating detail, perhaps, but uh, but it's it's a cute touch if you um, you know once you get it. <laughs> um, so now we got to figure out where this goes. That's interesting. You know, it, it could uh, it could be flipped any which way. Um, I think we're gonna go two down over here and then zigzag like that. Um, just a moment while I write this down. Okay. I got it wrong. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. There we go, alright. So we're done with this area, right? Or are we? Because the monastery is, um, is you know it's not it's not really about these puzzles. There's only a couple of them. The monastery's real shine is um, in the unification, or, or not unification, of course, but but bringing closer together. Um, this is the place where panel puzzles and environmental puzzles almost touch, right? Because it's a monastery, so it's all about uh, that that kind of direct perception 
that the environmental puzzles are are all are uh, are famous for. So here we're gonna start. We're gonna close things down on this side, open them up on this side, and they're gonna open up onto this uh, this very um, kind of beautiful summery uh, pavilion here, where we've got these gourds, we've got funny colored um, yellow lines, patterns of leaves. To the to the novice, even to the novice witness player, you know this is a little conspicuous. It's like, what exactly is going on with all these yellow leaves, right? And uh, to the experienced witness player, this is like, obviously you're trying to you're starting to line up the uh, the gourds and things immediately. But the monastery almost functions as a tutorial for the environmental puzzles, right? It's a temple devoted to those environmental puzzles and the direct awareness uh, that they that they promote. Um, and these um, these uh, walls here are um, they're, they're I mean it's like how could you get this is like one of one of a couple places where the witness is like really tutorializing the environmental puzzles and making it hard to miss. Another one that many players encounter is is up there on top of the mountain where you have the panel that matches uh, the river path. Um, and then another one that uh, that unfortunately I neglected to mention in my like intro to the intro to the witness um, initial episodes was um, this little drainage pipe is like viewable from the very first vista you have of the town. So that's there to just like the ones in the in the castle, but it's a little bit more obvious than the ones in the castle. It's one of those ones where it's like oh it was there from the very beginning, like it was staring me in the face the whole time. But um, but besides besides the castle river path, this is probably one of the most obvious areas in the game because you just finished tracing these paths over here through this iron grating, and here you're just doing the exact same thing. It's very easy to line this up to notice what's going on, and all you got to do is click. So. Um, So again, that's that's devoted to the monastery's theme um, of of direct perception. The EPs are sort of the 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 monastery's home turf, um, but uh, and and there's there's other ways that we can see this too. For instance, the the lines they're all yellow. Um, they're yellow in here um, because yellow is sort of a tutorial color. It's the color of the um, of the first panels that we traced in the castle. You know, it just kind of symbolizes that things are easy. They're looking good. Um, so we don't have to do all these environmental puzzles, but let's um, let's just take a look at uh, what's going on here because there there are things being depicted in these murals. Um, so this uh, is uh, it's it's a man. You can see the the outline of a face and nose, and there he's uh, or or she could be a woman um, who's kneeling um, on a kind of rocky crevice right this this looks like it's falling away like there's a big cliff here maybe these are clouds in the background or something uh, little clouds rocks kneeling human and then here we've got these weird like lightning lightning strike shapes um, emanating from off screen and they're reaching way over like their center of gravity is like balanced you know right on the cliff's edge um, they're reaching over for something. What are they reaching for? Well, fortunately, this has kind of a comic panel type look. Oh, and it's it's worth noting. Uh, where's the gourd here? It's in their head. You know, the brain. That's that's the seat of awareness as far as uh, as neuroscience has been able to discern. Um, now, we've got a we've got a second mural, and what do we see? Emphasized in the gourd, in that little funny outline there. Right? This could have just been a yellow gourd, but instead, you know, it was missing to fit this piece exactly to give you a clue of how to line it up um, and and perhaps just a further reminder to players who like if you didn't get the environmental puzzle here because here it's kind of hard to notice that the lining up is perfect here it's like really easy to notice that these two things fit perfectly um, so it, it just kind of makes it even more clear um, but uh, but this is our tiny kneeling human right there they are arms outstretched um, and and here it seems like they're um, they're standing at the edge of a bridge, a, a broken bridge over this massive cliff. Um, so, what does that symbolize? Well, 
I think it's Kuz's wall of paradise, right? There's this uncrossable gap. You know, they're on the one side. Something else is on the other. They're, they're reaching desperately across that bridge. You remember also from the Feynman video, he talked about uh, building a, a bridge, drawing a line carefully from one side to the other of uh, between, you know, with the fundamental physics on the one hand and things like truth and beauty and, as he put it, political expediency and all these other phrases and concepts that we have, the universe, God, things like that on the other side. So this is about... Uh, bridging those gaps. Um, the Feynman video talked about that. That's not quite the duality that the witness is talking about. The witness is doing that that kind of uh, uh, scientific perspective, the, the external versus internal views. Um, the the fortress, which we'll talk about soon, also had its own duality of um, the two ways of looking at society. The um, the the individual centric kind of first-person view on human civilization, which is full of drama, struggle, social relationships, um, class divisions, things like that, and uh, and the top-down view of society where everybody's sort of just responding to their environment, they're all, they have their incentives, they're moving around like rats in a maze, there's demographics, there's very predictable kind of mass scale history, the individual isn't very important, that kind of thing. Um, so this person is trying to reach across Kuz's wall of paradise um, to, to resolve that that's seemingly unresolvable um, uh, gap or paradox or just distance between these these two things that are true but irreconcilable. Um, but what specifically are they reaching across to? Well, here it is. They're reaching across to the cup. Uh, this is like a weird game where you've got to lower the uh, you've got to lower the um, cover, uh, and you know, and then that allows you to complete this. Um, but here's that goblet, right? And now this is interesting. So, so notice the goblet is emitting these wacky lightning rays. So here we're looking in profile. We see the person looking off to the side, and we see wacky lightning rays. And now we see a zoomed out view. The person is reaching across. The goblet is going to be right over here with the wacky lightning rays coming across sideways. Um, but now we're no longer looking in profile. Now we're looking from the person's perspective, right? Even though this is still a, a 2D mural, it's portraying. Now we're looking through the vision of that of that human. Um, so it's it's another classic witness switch from the third person to the first person because now we're looking through their eyes um, uh, directionally towards the cup. And and in fact, this mural reminds us of that by these other ones we had to get like pretty close in order to like. Eh, well, I guess that's a little bit. It's a little bit far back there, um, but uh, but for the for the cup, it makes us it makes us like really step back and line the cup, uh, line up the cup like a you know a good ways back from where we were before, um, and um, so so this just you know solidifies that that goblet that kind of um, holy grail as the object of yearning that also represents the sun. Everything is flaming yellow, you know. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So the witness is describing that it's it's kind of describing that code of symbols that we also saw on the mountain over there. That's why I wanted to to talk about the uh, sorry not the mountain the peninsula. That's why I wanted to talk about the peninsula. Um, and um, it's it's tutorializing the environmental puzzles. But what else is it saying? There's an equivalence here, right? There's three panels that have the environmental puzzle. I mean, there's three panels that have the panel puzzles, and then there's the three murals over here that have the uh, the environmental puzzles. The, the monastery is saying these things are equal, like they're on an even footing. They're both necessary. They're just like the two sides of this bridge. They're, um, uh, they're, they're two halves of the same coin. This is that kind of paradoxical, uh, you know, unification of opposites that, uh, that the witness loves and that, and that this monastery is also also loves. But, of course, there's a third side. Well, there's really four sides to this area, but this is just a tutorial entrance, and it's impossible to open these uh, while, while we do, but, you know, whatever. Alright, the point is, there's three um, like functional sides to, uh, to the monastery, and the last one is this one over here. So we'll, we'll check out uh, what we have on this side. So, um, this has a couple different uh, uh, things going on. There's there's a there's a um, some art outside on the thing that houses the laser box, um, and if you line this up correctly, 
you can see a mural of like a fierce harpy, right? Just like in the reflection area, she's got these big talons, beautiful woman uh, playing some kind of lute or instrument or something. Um, but evil fierce talons, like a siren that's going to lure your ship to to crash in the in the earlier version of the story. Oh, does this not show us anything? Okay, this just shows us sort of like the uh, the full view of that artwork. There we go. It's quite a mess without, you know, it's, this is almost saying like without interpretation, it's, you know, it's, it's actually related to an important audio log, which unfortunately is covered up by another, um, by another thing. So we'll, we'll get back to the audio log, but keep in mind like how chaotic this is to interpret. I mean, now that you've seen the woman, you can, you can make her out, but like, this is just a blob. Like, what is all this happening down here? You know, like, what are all these spots? Who knows? Um, so we'll put this back down and just keep keep in mind that confusion for for a later discussion of the audio log. All right, so here we see the kind of uh, evil harpy siren over here. We can also line things up um, to see. Uh, sort of a neutral view of just just the reclining woman or I mean without much context it kind of looks like she's sprinting or falling through space or something but she's definitely a normal human um, I wonder if anything's viewable through there I don't know um, and uh, and then over here we see her sort of in her in her full her final form um, as that lined up properly. There we go. Um, as a, a an angelic uh, savior creature, although she still does have the talent, the talents. Um, so what's that saying? Well, you know, I think the angel thing is a little bit related to this um, to this uh, uh, a relic of an earlier version of the witness story that I also talked about when we saw the siren statue. Um, which involves like a sinking ship and some guy named Thomas and stuff like that. If we go outside, we can see there's like this large ship. There's the prow of the ship, the sail, all the oars, some waves, um, maybe some rocks over here that the ship is uh, is crashing into. Um, and then uh, over on this side, we can see uh, this this highlighted uh, area which, if that doesn't make any sense, uh, the reflection down here reveals as a, a sort of like a drowning uh, man, right, lost in the waves. There's his face, there's his, there's his hand, um, right, thrown overboard by the ship, like calling to help for, from that ambiguous, is she good or is she bad, uh, siren, angel creature. Um, as for the, the reflection, I think maybe this look, kind of looks like a, the that Egyptian god icon of like the eye, um, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, so, so most of that is, uh, I kind of discount that as a relic of a previous story, some about ships. Um, but, um, but this does carry an important message. I mean, they would have thrown it out if they didn't think it was important to, to keep in the game. They could have just made the whole laser box colored white and nobody would have noticed that, that anything was missing. But they kept it in, I think, to emphasize two things, which is, hey, not only do we have the, the puzzle panels on par with the uh, environmental puzzles, but, um, but also there's this kind of hidden art in The Witness. You know, there, there's all these little things that you can just notice. They don't give you points. They don't line up monoliths, anything like that. Um, but, uh, but this, so, so the monastery is functioning. It, it, it's making this philosophical point about the environmental puzzles, but it's also just making a, a bit of a game design point for the players, which is like, hey, there's stuff in the game. There's, there's this third pillar of just like beautiful art things that you can notice, right? Like the fact that this tree uh, is a kind of a simplified two-dimensional bonsai mirror of this larger tree that's busting through the, uh, uh, busting through the area. Like you don't have to notice that in order to, you know, you could just never realize that. Uh, that there's like a representation going on when you use this switch to open the walls, um, but um, 
but it's it's nice, and it's part of what makes The Witness an, a nice game. So you'd think it would be impossible to tutorialize something like that, but uh, but here in the monastery area, it is sort of tutorialized via this picture of the ambiguous harpy. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna catch an audio log here. Um, it's right here next to this yearning human, and next to the you know this this environmental puzzle, which is uh, is gonna be. For, for some people, it's going to be their first one because it's kind of a tutorial section. There is nothing in existence but veils hung down. Acts of perception attach themselves only to veils, which leave traces in the owner of the eye that perceives them. Binarabi 1231. Nothing ex in existence but veils hung down, which leave traces in the owner of the eye that perceives them. Um, I think this, even though that's a, a quote from an, uh, an Arab uh, scholar, I think this is meant to line up with the, the Buddhist and Zen influence of this temple. It's talking about the, uh, the way that, I mean, the, the only... Th reality we we all believe in an external reality but the only reality that we have access to are the representations of objects as we perceive them in our conscious awareness um and uh you know that the nature of of the physical objects that we look at the nature of uh light and color um it's all uh it's hard to be articulate on the fly while making these videos um but those, those, there's, there's nothing solid. Um, there's nothing. The solidity, the realness of all of the objects in our world, al although we're trained to to think of them as real because we have this bedrock belief in the external reality. But you know, really, as as conscious perceptions, they're arising and and uh, passing away in every moment. Um, and uh, and they're they're anything but solid. They're these flat two-dimensional images, um, and we don't really know anything about them scientifically. Um, so, hence the quote, I guess. Can activate this laser, and uh, like so many things in the witness, this uh, uh, you know the laser is um, is a final nod to the themes of the area. It shoots perfectly through this tiny hole in the in the tree in order to get to the top of the mountain, just like how we've been getting things lined up through these uh, murals. Oh, also another thing in the audio log, it's kind of a joke, right? Because veils hung down. The, these things are literally veils hung down in front of us. Um, so, of course, the, the, the person was not talking about a literal veil, but, um, but there it is. So this, I guess this ambiguous, I mean, earlier I was, I was dissing it as a relic of an earlier story, and in terms of the art, it's also a little weird. Nothing else in The Witness looks like this. It's this mishmash of colors and shapes. It's difficult to recognize you know, the boat here, there might be other stuff, you know, like, is this supposed to be a mountain? You know, it's like very difficult to see what's going on. Um, and yet with the right framing, right, with the right veil, we can see the the shape of this, of this woman that's hidden in this picture. Um, and uh, I think that's also maybe a bit of a commentary on, I mean, why else would this strange art art style be here that doesn't show up anywhere else in the game. I think this is a bit of a commentary on our our perception and the way our brains work. That when we're looking at something like this, it's very ambiguous. Like, you know, you could stare at this for a long time without realizing it's a boat. I'm sorry that I've ruined it for you, but, you know, may maybe we can we can look at this stuff, which, like, I have no... Is this supposed to be, like, a, a crocodile or something? You know, like, like any of these, they just look random to me. I, I don't see anything. Or, or on this side... Um, We've got the man here, but is the rest just swirling waves, or are there other people in here, or parts of a sunken ship? 
um, I can't make anything out, and yet once you recognize something like the man, it's unmistakable. You see his expression immediately. Um, so that kind of, you know, our brain is constantly, constantly doing that, and the process of recognizing an environmental puzzle is a similar clicking into place of a top-down interpretation. We have this constant bottom-up sense data, and our brain is always putting these interpretations on it. Um, and, uh, and even on higher levels, not just on the sense data, but like when we're playing this video game, The Witness, we, we put the very, very reasonable interpretations onto the things that we see, like that this is a game about, about uh, solving panels by drawing lines on them that'll cause many players to just entirely miss the environmental puzzles, even when they've been staring them in the face this entire time. Um, so our, our minds are always putting, uh, putting interpretations onto the onto the, the, this deluge of sense data that's coming towards us, um, and, uh, and, and those interpretations can be helpful. I mean, they're absolutely necessary for navigating the world, um, and just as, just as these, um, these little murals help us uh, see this art that would otherwise be hidden. But at the same time, they are veils, right? They're, they're preventing us from understanding the true nature of reality because we're just seeing the abstraction, we're seeing the summary, we're seeing the top-down expectation of what our brain thinks is there, rather than the kind of pure sense data of what's actually there. So one of the, the kind of uh, key ideas of meditation as practiced by Zen Buddhists and all kinds of Buddhists is just paying very close attention to the mind in order to try and get a better understanding of it. Um, that you know, if you if you pay sufficient attention, you might realize that a lot of the the that that you can actually be wrong about your own conscious experience. That that, that the way you think about uh, your emotions or um, or even even physical sensations is uh, when you when you uh, or your thoughts and the generation of your thoughts um, when you pay close attention to those, um, you you see that the raw sense data looks very different from the um, from the kind of summary interpreted version, uh, the top-down version that we uh, spend most of our lives dealing with and thinking about. So for one more little piece of, of ambiguous interpretation, um, earlier I, I referenced that uh, that these as, as little trees, right? And the trees are growing, they're getting taller, which makes sense. It's kind of a story of developing complexity. Um, you know, the puzzles get harder. This this tree starts out as like a nice little tree, and then it becomes like bigger, and then it becomes like this giant, massive, like like baobab looking thing, right? And of course, uh, that that's that's very fun in the monastery. The, the the tree interpretation is certainly relevant because we have this gigantic tree, right? That just like this one became like grew explosively and like exploded out of the building. Versus maybe it started as that tiny something like that tiny little bonsai over there. Um, but the witness is always doing two things at once, people. Um, and uh, so, well, except for this one, which I think is maybe genuinely actually a tree. Um, we see this kind of branching uh, structure. It's very flat, very two-dimensional. It looks exactly like those trees from the apple orchard. So it doesn't just look like any tree. It looks like one of those apple orchard trees. Um, but then here, I mean, this kind of looks like a tree. Uh, this definitely looks like a trunk and all that. But like this structure up here looks very different, like the, the, the way these branches are done. Um, and uh, just... Stay with me on this one. What if I told you that this looked like a human brain, right? Th rethink all these little corrugations, all these folds and wrinkles. I mean, doesn't it kind of look like a brain seen from the seen like a, like as if you were looking at another person uh, and just seeing right through their skull, right? So their eyes would be like right around here, but we're seeing through that. So we're seeing that front lobe, frontal lobe, um, and then uh, we're seeing that kind of bulging back of the brain. Um, but that, that, that on the, on the underside, um, but then in front of that bulging, uh, uh, hind brain, I, I don't know the term, um, is that the spinal cord. Um, so that's kind of interesting, like, um, tree, and then now we have a tree that could also be interpreted as a brain. Now you're saying, Jackson, you're crazy, but look at this. Okay, this doesn't look like a brain, but this, it doesn't really look like a tree either. Maybe there's, like, lightning splitting the tree open, okay, or maybe... Um, it is actually 
the outline of a nuclear explosion. Look at that. It's definitely a mushroom cloud. It's got the it's got the secondary line around it, like it's like a shock wave, right? Like what the hell is that line doing? This is clearly some kind of crazy explosion. Like the tree is like dying or being struck by lightning or something like that. Or like the wood is split open. I mean, it just it looks like a it looks like a mushroom cloud. Um, and you can't say the mushroom clouds aren't relevant to uh, to Jonathan Blow because he made Braid, which is all about atom bombs. It's not actually all about atom bombs, but come on, they're all over the place. Play my mod, Braid more now than ever. It's a great time. You'll have fun. Um, so, uh, so here we, we you know we've got this progression of um, of the, the trees getting older, and but we've also got this like really weird progression where like here, as far as I can tell, this really is just a tree. You know, you know maybe it's like branching, like multiplying bacteria or something, or like a lung. I don't know, um, or like a like the structures of a heart, right? Like the veins. Um, but we got this basic tree, which is kind of basic life, and uh, and then we've got the brain representing humanity. Um, you know, conscious um, conscious thought. Um, and then uh, finally, we've got this atom bomb explosion, which you know you gotta assume symbolizes something about technological society um, and uh, and modern civilization, as as just as you know, just as life gave rise to to humans, and humans can create technology and society. Um, so just you know, I don't know exactly how that ties into other things, but I'm pretty sure that that's correct. It it does a pretty nice, you know, I mean, sure does look like a brain once you think about it. Oh, so uh, so there's one more thing to talk about before we go over, and then we're gonna we're gonna look at the vault video that's related to this area. So we've completed this. We've got this nice red laser, this beautiful red temple. Um, perfect framing. Look at that. The witness up to its old tricks. The monastery is directly across from the temple. Why would that be? Um, So these two areas, I think they're in a kind of dialogue. Um, the, the monasteries are more about the environmental puzzles and the panel puzzles are, they're, the panel puzzles are like being tugged over to the side of the environmental puzzles. The panel puzzles here, you, you have to line up objects and then once you line everything up just right, then the solution is immediately apparent, which is exactly how you normally solve environmental puzzles. Versus in the fortress, it's the other way around. The puzzles reign supreme. The environmental puzzles are just sort of acknowledgments or, or recapitulations of the puzzles that you already solved. And the environmental puzzles in the in the backyard of the fortress, where where you have those double solutions, and you you might have to go down and resolve the pressure plates in a different way to create a path that's traceable from high up that doesn't get blocked by like a stack of bricks or an ink splotch or something. Um, over there, those environmental puzzles. Are, are like the closest that, that environmental puzzles anywhere in the entire game, uh, except maybe in the mountain, I suppose. Um, but uh, the closest that they ever get to being um, to being like logical and uh, and based on analytical thinking rather than like direct perception. Usually, you see an environmental puzzle, and it's pretty obvious how to get it if you can't get it like that very uh, moment from where you're standing. Um, so they're in a, in a dialogue, which I think is so uh, beautiful and and uh, and funny because, of course, each of these have their own heavy emphasis on duality, right? The, the castle has the front yard and the backyard, which talk about the two different views of viewing society. The monastery has the left and right sides, which balance uh, the kind of direct perception of the environmental puzzles, which you might also associate with that kind of... Um, the more direct uh, Rinzai school of Zen Buddhism, as one of the audio logs in the mountain we'll talk about, um, versus the uh, the puzzle panels, so more about slow, steady achievement, more about more in the style of the Soto Zen school, um, uh, balancing out its own duality there uh, in the monastery. Um, and uh, and of course this balance it's also represented architecturally, right? You have this very forbidding um, castle versus this, this relatively welcoming uh, open monastery, the eastern architecture versus western architecture. They're both from a kind of medieval period, right? So in an earlier episode, we talked about the um, the desert ruins over there are like this ancient primordial civilization first emerging from the depths of time. But then things diverge. Different cultures go in different directions and have different interests. Um, so that gives us our 
our monastery and castle very deliberately arranged, you know. Um, they didn't have to be tilted to face each other exactly, but they were. Um... beautiful river. There's uh, some interesting symbolism when it comes to the river, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about later, but um, water is, there's some interesting associations of water in the witness. It's kind of associated with magic, um, with things that are a little bit, um, uh, I mean, it's flowing, so it's associated with time. It, it, it brings some of those braid themes back, um, as well as its own, uh, ideas of like magic and paradox. Um, so here we're walking through, we see a nice variation on, on the stuff that we've solved before with this kind of beautiful rock puzzle. This one's also interesting, I suppose, and uh, not really because of the puzzle, because it's not much harder than the others, um, but because it's, it's a natural shape, it seems uncarved by humans, it's just like part of the rocks. Um, so that's, uh, that, you know, that's interesting to have a, a natural shape. Well, I guess it's other places on the islands where there's plenty of natural shapes that feed into the puzzles. But, uh, but more importantly than giving us access to, uh, to the Zen Garden, it gives us access to this, the vault. Um, beautiful vault, ditches the red for uh, a kind of greenish teal color which is, remember, that kind of symbolism of the unification of opposites, symbolized by uh, black and white. Um, and we've got a bit of a yin-yang design here, right? Like, we're going to end up separating these, uh, these two shapes somehow, and we've got to go through the middle to get the hexagon, so very yin-yang. Um, but, of course, this area is all about lining things up, so, you know, we'll go back here, we don't see anything. Eventually, we realize, man, all these roots up here, one of those is going to be the solution. So this is a final game design twist on, frankly, the monastery idea, the puzzle panel side is very stunted there, versus there's so many environmental puzzles. I've only done uh, a very small number of them, um, but like there's, there's a beautiful sequence. I mean, the, there are the tutorial sequence down there. Um, there, are, there are a bunch just around the, around the walls. There's one that you can get right around here. Long, long snaky pattern. Um, like I said, there's like four or five right there. There's a couple in the Zen Garden. Um, there's just an incredible density. And then there's uh, there's this gigantic banyan tree, right? The same type of tree, same type of tree, just larger as the one growing in the monastery. So that kind of ties it to the monastery. And it has like this super elaborate process going on. Like a total 360. So, um, so a very stunted puzzle sequence here, um, but it's counterbalanced by this 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 strong emphasis placed on the environmental uh, puzzles. But the final gameplay twist that they can have on this somewhat stunted sequence of puzzles is trying to figure out, like, how are we going to apply this direct perception, bring in more of that logical, uh, that uh, uh, logical sequence of events um, and logical thinking that that is typical of the panels um, to this to this mechanic that's otherwise all about direct perception. So, like, that's not going to work. You know, we got to go around and find something that's going to fit lot of possibilities. Not really much of a way to, uh, it looks like this one works, you know, but like not much of a way to, to do the uh, trial and error on these. Of course, you can immediately rule out the ones that, that just completely block the, uh, the entrance. Um, there might also be one or two around here that, that function, but, uh, but they, like in that they allow you to trace a line, but then of course if the line doesn't satisfy the constraints of separating black and white tiles and collecting that hexagon, um, then it's no good. But there we go, there we get access to the vault. Uh, 
maybe this would be a good time to talk about water symbolism just briefly, because uh, when you think about the under underground, um, all those the caves of the challenge area are actually um, directly below the monastery. So so. Um, I mean, the challenge area is, is extended. It's like multiple rooms that stretch from basically from the town theater zone to uh, to the mountain. But uh, but one of the largest, curviest, most beautiful sections of the challenge is like pretty precisely positioned right underneath the monastery, which like the the this this uh, this banyan tree's roots are going to be like going down into that cave and soaking up that kind of magic paradoxical like a uh, kind of non-Euclidean um, uh, tessellating uh, river flow that's in that underground river down there. Um, so that's a little bit little bit about the water symbolism. Keep that in mind. We'll probably talk about it more way later when we do an episode on the challenge. Got these roots coming down, and uh, there's our pattern. So I'll head over to the town and play that video again. Um, you know, there's going to be highlights in the uh, in the YouTube description. You can always stop and come back to this later. Um, you can always just run the highlights if you want to get to the good parts. Then you don't have to watch me schlepping all over this town. Um, so, uh, because this video doesn't have any words, and because I'm trying to go a little bit faster, and because this video is notoriously boring, although it does have a part to play in the game, I'm going to talk uh, during uh, the video. Um, so, uh, some context for this, which otherwise just appears as like this raw, you know, ten-something minute clip, um, this is a movie by uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, the Russian uh, director of movies like Stalker and Solaris, um, called Nostalgia. Uh, the story involves this guy who's uh, who's like a writer, um, and he traveled he's traveled from Russia to Italy in order to study the works of a previous writer who came here. But he's like he's beset by all of these pangs of, of nostalgia for his former home. Anyways, long story short, he at one point encounters this kind of town madman. Um, and the madman uh, is like this man of great faith. Um, there's a lot of kind of magic water symbolism, which now I think about that for the first time, ties in with the kind of magic water symbolism of the witness. Um, but the town madman gives him this candle that he's holding. And, uh, and the candle is... Uh, uh, the madman assures him that that if that the world is about to end, um, and uh, and he and the world will end uh, unless he can manage this feat, uh, which the madman attempted, but other people in the town stopped him because they thought the madman was trying to drown himself, of carrying the lit candle all the way from one end to the other, then the world will be saved, which is obviously insane, and he's just a ranting crazy person, but. Uh, but the main character of the of the film interprets this man as like the a man of uh, deep 
faith, and he's he's portrayed by the movie as like a, a kind of wise person, even though he's crazy. Um, and so this comes at the end of the movie that uh, the main character, uh, even though he doesn't, you know, he, he's also taking a leap of faith because of course he doesn't trust the madman, and yet he's kind of compelled by the whole uh, the whole idea um, that he carries this candle across. Um, so, uh, so this, this clip definitely represents a kind of, uh, uh, spiritual act, right? It's not just, like, some random thing that this guy's doing for no reason. Um, although, if you just see the clip by itself, then that is, uh, that is the, the kind of the only interpretation you could draw if you're just seeing the raw clip. Um, so, just to provide a little bit more context, I'm gonna, uh, read something about the filming of the scene. So, according to the actor who's playing the main character that you're seeing right now, uh, when this actor first met, uh, the director, Tarkovsky, to direct, uh, to discuss the filming, the director asked the actor to help him fulfill a grand idea to, quote, display an entire human life in one shot, without any editing, from beginning to end, from birth to the very moment of death. Tarkovsky visualized life in the form of a candle. Remember the candles in the Orthodox churches, how they flicker, the very essence of things, the spirit, the spirit of fire. And so the act of carrying the candle across the stagnant pool was nothing less than the effort of an entire lifetime encapsulated into that one gesture. If you can do that, Tarkovsky challenged uh, the actor, if it really happens and you can carry the candle to the end, in one shot, straight, without cinematic conjuring tricks and cut in editing, then maybe this act will be the true meaning of my life. It will certainly be the finest shot I ever took. If you can do it, if you can endure to the end. So that's the context um, for uh, uh, the context for this super long, like unbroken, ten-minute shot. Very rare, right? You might see something longer in like uh, Alfonso Cuarón's Gravity, but that's like full of all these crazy special effects. So it's really not one shot. It's like multiple shots strung together with clever CGI. Um, but, uh, and of course there's so much action happening, versus this, it's very steady, it's slow, um, it's quite an endurance test to sit through, especially if, like so many players to the witness, like me until a couple days ago when I decided to watch the movie, uh, just so I could make this video better, um, you have no context at all for what's happening, it's just a guy carrying a candle across a lake, um, so... So this video is interesting because it demands that context. First, the others don't. If you don't know who Feynman was, if you don't know who Burke was, if you don't know who Spiro was, their videos stand completely alone. Versus this, it's a, it's rather than a presentation by some famous person, it's like a quotation of a work of art, um, which I think makes a difference. But first, it's important to consider what's the new player's experience. They play this, they see this as just a man doing some arbitrary crazy thing, and then he does, like, die at the end. Um... So the kind of surface level meaning of this is like, well, he's doing this kind of arbitrary thing. He's, he's kind of drawing a line. He's going back and forth. Um, so he's doing what I, the player, is doing. I'm, I'm sort of doing this tedious thing. It's clear, even without context, that this is some kind of ritualistic activity or some kind of act of faith. Um, and so the player might feel, well, I, too, am doing this seemingly arbitrary thing, uh, but, you know, it, it requires determination. It's very difficult. you got to try. you got to keep getting back up when you fall. Um, and, uh, and so that, that base message to the player with no context is, I think, a message of encouragement and solidarity and determination. The game is saying, you know, it's valuable to keep trying, and it's valuable to pay attention, and it's, you know... And it's it's important to keep going, even even when it seems like there's no reason for it. Um, the fact that it's one super long unbroken take, um, I also I definitely agree with Electron Dance's interpretation that it's communicating about attention span, right? It's 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 a little bit aggressive. They're throwing this long video at you, um, and they're expecting you to just sit there and watch the entire thing uh, with like unbroken. Uh, like wrapped attention when uh, out of context it's like a meaningless scene and even in context the movie Nostalgia is full of these super long uh, shots which are like uh, not the most exciting thing to watch I can say after uh, having seen the movie um, so uh, so I think that message is kind of saying the witness is saying like look I know that the game would be more interesting if I put lots of action in it and if I like gave you like lots of little points when you completed the panels but 
the witness is saying through this to the player with no context, I'm intentionally, like, things are intentionally a little bit, like, slow-paced, a little bit of a long take, because you need that attention sometimes. Uh, you, you need that patience, um, or that difficulty, that inaccessibility, because some things, you know, art is not just about giving people what they want. Sometimes things that seem boring or even pretentious can secretly be worthwhile. Um, this also is a good fit for the meditation area because, of course, the first thing that you run into when you start meditating is, like, boredom. Um, and But you have to learn to look past that and be able to look closely at what your experience is really like. We'll give some time to, for this scene to play out. So the candle clearly represents something important. The mystery is what? Is it life? Is it scientific progress being passed from one generation to another? Is it, you know, it's, it's probably something different in Jonathan Blow's mind from in uh, Tarkovsky's mind, of course. But it's this candle being ferried, like, from birth to death, from one generation to the next. It's being carried forward in time, um, which to me strikes me as an important message of the witness, which is so often about individual experience. You know, in Braid, uh, Tim from Braid, he was so zealous. He just wanted to go straight for the prize. He didn't care who he hurt or what got in the way. It was all about himself. And the witness also you know, it's focused on the individual experience, the personal. It doesn't want to talk about society too much. It doesn't want to, it doesn't spend a lot of time talking about history. And yet it cares deeply about history. It cares about human progress. And it knows that it's, it doesn't have the answers, you know? We're all probably going to die without realizing the solution that the witness wants us to have. Um, without getting that to that transcendent point symbolized by the sun. Um, and, uh, and yet, I think this clip, with or without context, is saying it's important to carry that knowledge forward, whether it's sort of the, the lineage of the Buddhist masters, of the enlightened teachers, um, or, uh, or the kind of slow process of, of science building up generation upon generation. You've got to carry it forward to the next generation. It's a collaborative process. The whole society's involved, right? It's a monastery. There's lots of people. It's a town. Everyone's coming together. Um, this black and white scene... Um, the shift to black and white uh, is um, in the movie that's that's used to represent like memory and flashbacks and the author's nostalgic experience of Russia. He has all these nostalgic scenes of his wife, his dog, which you see right here, his children, that kind of thing. Um, but now for the first time he appears in the scene and also for the first time instead of just a, a scene of Russia uh, with, the, with the Russian Dhaka um, and the wilderness, um, we also have the this it's a Russia contained in this impossible miniature, this kind of paradoxical uh, duality um, inside of this Italian uh, cathedral. Um, so it's these two opposite things that have been reconciled um, with this act of faith. Um, and it's also kind of him passing into, uh, into death. Um, and it's also black and white in The Witness, symbolizes the unification of opposites. In, in nostalgia, it symbolizes memory. Um, but uh, but we've got black and white symbolizing this this kind of things and uh, what do we see here? It's the the sneakiest of sneaky environmental puzzles, which is just like perfectly framed, except there's a little bit of cathedral in the way. So let me just sneak around and make sure that we grab this. going right at the top, interestingly. <laughs> so that straight down um, kind of uh, keyhole shape, right? Bright white, and the outline uh, was that teal color that symbolized the unification of opposites. Um, uh, I mean, in a way, it's just kind of too good of an environmental puzzle to ignore, but uh, I think it's also an important piece of symbolism, color symbolism.
So there's a lot of different interpretations that people put on this video, and it's definitely up for interpretation. It's much less clear and explicit than uh, you know all the other videos, um, certainly compared to like the Feynman or the Burke video. Um, it's uh, it's partly about determination, um, and uh, and kind of encouraging the player. It's partly about attention spans, and for that, you know, the the Electron Dance video covers that pretty well. Uh, his video is. Um, uh, the unbearable now, an interpretation of the witness, um, and uh, we also get we get the symbolism that that Tarkovsky puts in there, the candle being carried across a lifetime, uh, an act of faith, right? Because we don't know what happens when we die. You know, we don't. Know. Maybe our lives don't amount to anything, um, but uh, but we're we're still carrying forward the human race, you know, we're like carrying forward the uh, carrying forward that scientific and meditative knowledge. Um, we also have the fact that it's a uh, we're it's a quotation of other art. Um, and so we'll see in the Psalm Secret of Psalm forty six video we get to that, um, we talk a lot about art versus the Feynman videos don't talk about art, the Burke video specifically puts down art, the other two videos are, are about meditation. Um, and so I, I think, you know, if the candle is carrying something forward to the next generation, it's a bit of an explanation of like, why, why is Jonathan Lowe making the witness? Well, he wants to put something out there for the world. He's not just interested in his own individual experience, otherwise he would just like stick around reading books or he would never release the game or something. Um, so, um, so it's a, it's a bit of an artistic statement. I mean, Tarkovsky's movies are like very elaborately constructed. They have all the symbolism. They've got a lot going on. Um, but uh, but it's as a result of being a a quotation of of another piece of art. Um, al although that's setting out a a goal. The witness is saying, "Hey, I I want to be like these movies of Tarkovsky." Um, but, uh, you know, like, I, I want the witness to be something of lasting artistic and philosophical value, something that adds to our human knowledge as we go forward uh, through the generations, which is a big goal, of course. Um, but, you know, but pe people should be allowed to have big goals in their, in their lives. They can aspire to big things. Um, and the Secret of Psalm 46 video also definitely talks about that. Um, so I don't, I don't have, like, a total interpretation of this movie. Um, well, I mean, of of either the the short the clip in the witness or of the the actual movie nostalgia, um, but uh, but I hope it was edifying to talk about it. It is a beautiful scene in a way, albeit a bit slow. Um, and uh, that's it for uh, episode six of um, examining the witness, talking about the monastery. Um, I'll see you again in the next episode. Thanks for watching.